so we can get out of here uh, at, a, at a reasonable time tonight. Uh, so if you came to my last review, you'll remember that is the way I do reviews. Uh, I like to I, I just go through the problems on the practice set of practice problems. And uh, if there's one you want to see, say yes. Don't be bashful about saying yes. And if you don't want to see it, don't say anything. Somebody else might want to see it. Don't say no. I don't want to see it. I don't think anybody needs your seat for the rest of it. Um, there are quite a few seats down here in front that if you need to take a seat. So. All right, so uh, we'll just uh, get started here. All right, uh, so number one. You want to see that one? Okay. Uh, so it says, which of the following does not describe a metal? Uh, let's see, so uh, do metals tend to gain electrons? Do metals gain electrons? No, what do metals do? They tend to lose electrons, they become positively charged. So A, uh, that's why A is the answer. Hopefully that's what the answer key says. Yeah, that says A. So, so right off the bat, that's there. Let's look at the other ones. Uh, forms are not common with non-metals. We know our non-metals are set up some rules here. Okay, so we've got nitrogen, and when we look at nitrogen, uh, we see that nitrogen has uh, seven electrons there, so we've got to find homes for, uh, for seven electrons. So let's just set up the 1s, and the 2s, and the 2p. Okay, and we'll just start filling up our electrons there. So, uh, we can put 2 in the 1s, I can put 2 in the 2s, okay, that's taking care of 4 of the electrons, and now I have 3 electrons to go in. Now, we've got a couple of options uh, here. Uh, I could put 2 in the first orbital and put 1 in the second orbital. Uh, the problem is that violates uh, Hun's rule about them going in... Uh, unpaired initially with parallel spins. So that's how they're going to go in. They're going to go in one at a time here, like that, and that uses up all seven of my electrons. And so if we'd have had one more electron to go in, if we'd have had oxygen, then it would have paired up. But they won't pair up until they absolutely have to. And so that's why, um, which one is that? B is the correct answer, and C would not be the correct answer. C does have the correct number of electrons, but it, does, it has those electrons paired, and we have an empty orbital, and they're, not gonna, they're just not going to do that. Okay? Questions on two? Okay. Uh, number three. Yes. yes. So we're looking for the ground state electron configuration for iodine. And we see there, we, uh, we have a, uh, a noble gas notation. So let's look at iodine there real quick. We've got it here, number 53. And so we're going to go back here to krypton. Okay? And then we're just going to enter in all of these along in here as they go along. So we're going to start with krypton. Okay, that's the noble gas that comes just before iodine. And then for RB, we are in iridium, we're in uh, period five. 
and we got to fill in the two S's, the two S electrons there. Let me see if I can put this here. You can kind of see it. And then we've got to go all the way across the four D's. We're going to fill in all the four D's before we get to iodine. So 5S2, 4D10, and then to get to iodine, we're back into the 5P block, and we've got to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to get to iodine. So 5P5. So 5S2, 4D10, 5P5, with krypton out there in front. And so that's going to be B. Okay. For these larger uh, elements, use that periodic table to help you figure out where, where you are in your electron configuration. Okay. Or if you just want to write down that order that's in the book, you know, I know uh, I, did, I gave the lecture, you can write that down too. They always fill up in that order. Okay, questions on three? Okay, number four. Okay, place the following elements in order of increasing atomic radius. So I want to uh, put my smallest one first and then uh, let it get bigger as we go. So if we look at our periodic table, so our elements are phosphorus, barium, and chlorine. So for atomic radius, I know atomic radius uh, gets bigger as you go down, and it gets smaller as you go left to right. Okay, so bigger as you go down because you're adding shells, smaller as you go left to right because you're staying in the same shell, but increasing the positive negative charge and making that shrink. So uh, we can kind of look to see where phosphorus, barium, and chlorine are uh, relative to each other. And so we have like phosphorus here, chlorine here, and then barium is way the heck down here. Okay. So which of those do you think is going to be the biggest? Barium. So let's just put that one last. Okay, and then which is going to be bigger between phosphorus and chlorine? Phosphorus, because it's a little bit farther to the left, and so it doesn't have as much positive and negative attraction uh, between the protons and the electrons. So phosphorus is going to be uh, the next biggest one, and then chlorine is out here. So it should go phosphorus, I'm sorry, chlorine, phosphorus, barium. Did I go in the wrong order? No, there you go. Phosphorus. Chlorine, phosphorus, barium, B. There we go. Questions at all on that? I don't want you guys to think about, think of the order in which things go. All right. You guys know what you do with dead chemists, right? You bury them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Take a second. <laughs> What do you do if they're sick? You gotta cure them. And if you can't cure them, then you gotta bury them. Yeah, that's bad. Alright, uh, we're saying we got this guy before. Alright, let's see, number five. Yeah, I figured that was coming. So number five is, uh, is a lot like uh, number four there. So um, again, we want to take a look at the trends that we have with ionization energy, and it's just opposite. So ionization energy gets smaller as you go down, and it gets bigger as you go left to right. So uh, we want to compare uh, potassium, calcium, and rubidium. So potassium and calcium are right next to each other, and then rubidium is way down here. Okay, so, uh, which of those is going to be the easiest to take away? It's going to be the rubidium because it's farther, it's farthest down. That's that's pretty much the, the uh, what takes precedence. Is how far 
up or down is it? Because that's a big effect. That's now you're going out to a new shell, and that really reduces the ionization energy. So uh, since we're putting it in increasing order, right? Yep, so rubidium's going to come first because that's lowest. Okay, so that's going to be less. And then if we look at potassium and calcium, which of those is going to be next largest? It's going to be potassium. Why? Because uh, it increases as we go from left to right. And so potassium is going to be smaller than calcium. Okay, and then that's going to be smaller than calcium. So we should go rubidium, potassium, and calcium. Uh, so that would be E. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Questions at all on that? All right. Hopefully that helped. All right. Number six. Yes. Okay, so for number six, we're looking for the ground state electron configuration for selenium 2 minus. Now, whenever I'm doing an electron configuration for an ion, uh, what I like to do is just do it for the atom first, and then figure out where I need to add or remove electrons and go from there. So let's look at selenium. We see here selenium is element 34. And so uh, let's, we'll just go with a... Uh, um, Noble gas notation, that's what they give us in there. So we're going to go argon to start. Okay, and then we want to just uh, go, go for our, uh, our element. So we're going to have argon, and then we're going to have 4s2. And we've got to go all the way through the three Ds, so that's going to be 10. <laughs> And then we've got to go one, two, three, four into the 4P. So 4P4. Okay, so that's the element. Now, we don't want the element, we want the 2 minus ions. So am I adding electrons or removing electrons? Adding electrons because it's negative charge. So that's not going to be 4P4. I'm going to add two electrons, and that's going to be 4P6. Okay, is that making sense? I'm trying to make sure this thing is still recording. Huh? All right. Number seven. Yes. All right, so I'm going to show you a little bit of a trick with number seven. The first thing that we have to kind of ask ourselves, we've got to know what the idea of energy before we can do this problem. What does diamagnetic mean? Yeah, all electrons are paired. They are all paired. Okay? And the little trick I'm going to show you is, first thing you want to look at is look at the number of electrons. If you have an odd number of electrons, you can't have every electron paired. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you have an odd number of electrons, it cannot be diamagnetic. Now, the opposite is not true. If it has an even number, it has to be diamagnetic. That is not true. Okay? But if you have an odd, it cannot be diamagnetic. Okay? If it has an even number, it can be either para or di. So let's just look at our number of electrons there. So fluorine has how many electrons? We look at fluorine, and it has nine. That cannot be diamagnetic. Um, zinc... Uh, zinc has 30 electrons. That's a possibility. Lithium has three. That cannot be diamagnetic. Vanadium has 23. So that can't be diamagnetic. And rubidium has 37. So that cannot be diamagnetic. So just by virtue of elimination on this problem, we can see that the only possible one is zinc. So that must be the answer. Okay? Does that make sense? And now, if we look at the, uh, the valence shell, if we look at the electron configuration, the orbital diagram, rather, for zinc, uh, we're going to have our four S's and then our three D's. 
and we're going to have two electrons in that 4s, and then we see that we have 10 electrons in the 3d, and when you put it in the orbital configuration, zinc looks like that, and you can see that it is in fact diamagnetic. Okay. So if you look for something that's diamagnetic, the odd ones automatically get eliminated. Even numbered ones you got to go through and do, unless you only have just the one left. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so di or even numbered electrons can be either diamagnetic or paramagnetic, but odd numbered electrons can only be paramagnetic. Okay. Uh, number eight. Eight's a little bit of a trick. Uh, I don't like question eight. Um, simply because uh, we're adding a number to 10. 10 is not a transition metal, but it's so far down the periodic table, it does have the ability to act like a transition metal and form uh, multiple charges. And so that's why it has parentheses after it. Uh, so for SNO, what we, if we want to see what's the charge on that 10, well, we know oxygen is in group six, and so that's got to have a minus two charge, right? So there's just one oxygen there, so I have a total of a minus two. And then if I have a total of minus two for my negatives, how many positives do I have to have? Two. Got to have two. So the total for the tens have to be plus two. There's only one tin, and so it has to have both positive charges. So the tin here must be a plus two. So we would say that that is tin two oxide. I guess I, I should have written tin, not written the symbol there. Tin two oxide. Remember that two tells us what the charge is. We got lots of seats down here in front if any of you guys need a chair. All right. Number nine. Yeah? You want nine? Okay. So number nine says uh, give the formula for sodium perchlorate. So notice that perchlorate eight ends in an eight. Because it ends in an eight, you know you've got a polyatomic ion in there. Because if you didn't have a polyatomic ion in there, it always ended in ion. So an eight automatically tells you you've got a polyatomic ion. That and the per is just weird. So let's look at what we've got. We know we've got sodium. So we know sodium is Na. It's a group 1A metal. So we know it forms a single positive charge. We look at our polyatomic table here, and we've got, look, perchlorate right there. And it has the formula of ClO4 with a single minus charge. So let's just write ClO4 with a single minus. So I've got sodium with a single plus. I've got perchlorate with a single minus. How are those going to come together? Just a one-to-one. -one. Okay, so my formula is going to be Na. ClO4. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the one, yeah, the one I'm showing you right here is the exact thing you have on your test. It's got uh, uh, molecular geometries, it's got electronegativities, and it's got polyatomic uh, ions. That's the exact one you have on your test. <coughs> All right, uh, number 10. Yep, okay. So for number 10, give the name for P4O10. Okay, so we have two non-metals here, phosphorus and oxygen, and that means that we have to use our Greek roots to tell us how many of each element we have. Because phosphorus and oxygen form a couple of different compounds. So we can't just say it's phosphorus oxide because that would have the same name for lots of different compounds. So we've got to say that there's four phosphorus. So how do we say four phosphorus? Tetraphosphorus. Tetra so we're going to see tetraphosphorus. It's a mouthful. And then how do we say 10? Dec 
And then we've got O, so we say deck oxide. So tetraphosphorus deck oxide. So that tells me I have four phosphorus, ten oxygens. P4O10. Yeah. Do we get the Roman the Greek, the Greek roots? roots? Yeah. No, no, what I just showed you is exactly what you get. Okay. So yeah, those you gotta know. Yeah. So those you only have to know up to ten, right? It's just up to ten, yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna give you anything crazy like twenty five or anything. So. All right. Uh, let's see. Number eleven. Yeah. Yes. So for number eleven. We've got to calculate the molar mass for magnesium perchlorate. So we have magnesium perchlorate. And there's two perchlorates there. Now the thing to remember is that that two, after the perchlorate there, only modifies the perchlorate. It doesn't affect the magnesium. So I have one magnesium, I have two chlorines, and I have eight oxygens. Because okay, the perchlorate has one chlorine and four oxygens, and there's two of those there. So for the magnesium, my one magnesium is 24.31. My chlorine is 35. Uh, what is it? 45. Yeah. 45 times two, and oxygen is going to be 16.00 times 8. So I multiply all those together and then add it all up. And when you do that, you get 223.21. And that's going to have units of grams per mole. Okay, that's the number of grams per one mole. for the mass percent of lithium in Li3PO4. Anytime you're doing a mass percent, all you're doing is saying how much does this component weigh divided by how much does the entire molecule weigh. And then you just multiply that by 100. So you're taking the fraction. What fraction of the weight belongs to this element? And then times 100 gives you a percent. So, uh, we see that we have three lithium atoms in there. So, our total mass of lithium is going to be three times 6.94 grams per mole over the total mass, which is three times 6.94 grams per mole plus uh, we've got phosphorus, 30.97 grams per mole, plus 4 times 16 grams per mole. Then I take all of that and multiply it by 100%. And when you do that, you get 17.98%. Okay, so you just take a look at how much, for what I'm looking for, how much is that weigh divided by how much does the entire thing weigh. And that should get you your percent. Number 13. You should know better than to even ask. I had a lot of questions on this one today. Uh, what is the empirical formula of a compound that is 64.8% carbon, 13.6% hydrogen, 21.6% oxygen uh, by mass. So when you're given uh, percents, you may be given these kind of problems either as a percent 
by mass for each element, or you just may be given a mass uh, for each element. Uh, if you're given a percent, then what you do is you just assume that if you had a 100 gram sample, what would be the makeup? Okay, so if I had a 100 gram sample, I would have 64.8 grams of carbon, I would have 13.6 grams of hydrogen, and 21.6 grams of oxygen. Okay, and now I can work from there as if I had a mass. So the first thing we want to do is turn that all into moles. So we're going to divide each element by its molar mass. And so, where did my sheet go? There it is. All right, so for carbon, we're going to take 64.8 grams times one mole per 12 grams. I'm just rounding here, 5.396 moles. For hydrogen, I have 13.6 grams times one mole per one gram. That gives me 13.6 moles of hydrogen. And then for oxygen, I have 21.6 grams times one mole per 16 grams. That gives me 1.35 moles. Okay, so now I can write a temporary chemical formula. I can write it as C, 5.396, H, 13.6, and O, 1.35. Sorry. It's not a very good chemical formula at that point. Okay, so what I have to do is I want to divide by my smallest number that I have in those, or in those, uh, those values down here, my subscripts. So that's going to be 1.35. So we're going to divide everything by 1.35. And when I do that, I get uh, C, 4, H, 10, and O, 1. And so that becomes my empirical formula because I've taken, I can't reduce that any farther. It's like fractions. I've got O down to 1. That's as far as I can reduce any of that. Okay. So C4, H10, O would be my empirical formula. Questions on that? Yeah. If it was like what? 3.5. So if my carbon had come out to something like 3.5, then I would have multiplied everything by 2. And I would have had C7H2O2. Yeah. Yeah, you should get pretty nice. If, if you come out to fractions, it should be like thirds or quarters or halves. So. All right. Uh, number 14. Yes, okay. So for 14, we're just uh, converting our grams into moles. Okay, so we've got chemical formula for pyridine of C5H5N. Okay, and when we add up our five carbons, our five hydrogens, and our nitrogen, we add up all those masses, uh, we get a molar mass for pyridine which comes out to be 79 grams per one mole. Okay, so that's, that gives me my molar mass for a period. I just add up the mass of five carbons, 12 each, five hydrogens, one each, and the nitrogen at 14. Okay, and that comes out to 79 grams per every one mole. And so now I want to know how many moles is 3.13 grams. So I do 3.13 grams, I'm going to multiply that by the molar mass somehow. Remember, the molar mass is a conversion factor. It's a conversion factor between grams and moles. That's why it's grams per mole. I can also write moles per gram. So, I have one mole per 79 grams. 
And I want my grams on the bottom so that they cancel here. So this gram cancels with that gram and it leaves me with moles on the top. And when I finish that out, I get 0 0.0396 moles. Okay, everybody good with that? Pretty straightforward. We haven't done a lot of those conversions yet. We'll be doing a lot of them here in the next unit. All right, number 15. Yeah, I saw that one coming too. So, number 15. A similar problem to what we had up on number 13, but just a little bit different. Uh, it goes a little bit farther. So, we've got a compound with 40% carbon, 6.71% hydrogen, and 53.29% oxygen by mass. We know the molecular weight of the compound is 60.05 uh, AMUs. You could also say grams per mole. You get the same value. And we're looking for the molecular formula of this compound. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to assume that we have a 100 gram sample. So if we do that, that means that we're going to have 40 pinot grams of carbon. We're going to have uh, 6.71 grams of hydrogen. And we're going to have 53.29 grams of oxygen. Okay, we want to convert those into moles using our molar mass. So we're going to do times one mole per 12 grams. For hydrogen, it's going to be times one mole per one gram. And for oxygen, it's going to be one mole per 16 grams. So when we calculate all of that out, for our carbon we get 3.33 moles. For our hydrogen we get 6.71 moles. And for our oxygen we get 3.33 moles. So now we can write that temporary chemical formula. That's going to be C. 3.33 H 6.71 O 3.33 Okay, we divide all the coefficients or all those subscripts by the smallest one that we've got, which here is going to be 3.33 You can kind of see where this is going to go Okay, so that's going to give me C1, H2, and O1. Now I know that the H doesn't come out to be exactly 2, but it's close enough. You, know, you might have little variations here and there in the hundreds, and that's okay. Don't try to get it exact um, with values. So we have C, H2, O. So that's the empirical formula. Okay, that's kind of like the Lego building block. So, since we have a molar mass for our actual compound, what we want to know is how many of those building blocks is it going to take to get to the appropriate mass. So, for this one, we want to figure out, well, how much does one of those building blocks weigh? Well, carbon weighs 12, two hydrogens is 2, so that's 14, and oxygen is 16, and so this is equal to 30 grams per mole for that one building block. So one building block weighs 30. I need to get to 60. So how many of those building blocks do I need? I need two. So I just multiply all of my subscripts there by two to get my actual chemical formula. So we'll just say times two and that gives us C2H4O2 and that's going to be 60 grams per mole which is what the problem was looking for. And you get the little variation yeah, you're going to get little variations here and there. Yeah. I, I could have carried more decimals out for my molar masses and stuff, and it probably would have fixed it. No, I mean, because it's asking 2.5. Well, I know, yeah, yeah, like I said, if I carried all that through, it probably would have come out. Okay. I just don't feel like writing all those numbers. All right, that was 15. Turn the page again here. Yep. 
Let's see, number 16. Yeah, so number 16 says there are blank paired and blank unpaired electrons in the Lewis symbol for a phosphorus atom. So if we look at phosphorus, we know it's got a P. Okay, let's write the Lewis dot structure for phosphorus. If we look on the periodic table, we'll see phosphorus is in group five. That means it's got five valence electrons. So we're going to go one, two, three, four, five. And so if we look at that, how many paired electrons are there? There's two. There's one pair, but there's two paired electrons. It's terrible wording. I, I, won't, I, won't, uh, I won't deny that. So we have two paired electrons, and then how many unpaired? Three, and three unpaired. I gave that problem once on a test many years ago. Most of the class missed it. I think I did too, and I was trying to make the key. Because <laughs> we don't think, normally think of the number of paired electrons. We think of the number of electrons in pairs, pretty much everything we do. So that's, that's pretty much what I do from here on out. All right, uh, number 17. Good. I think you guys would need 17. Number 18. Good. Wait, can we do 17? 17? Yeah. So for phosphorus, if you look at the periodic table, well actually we can just look at this one here. For phosphorus, look at the periodic table too. Uh, you've got two options for phosphorus to get a filled outer shell. It can either gain three electrons and look like argon, or it can lose five electrons and look like neon. Okay, it's always going to do the smaller number. So which is it going to do? Gain three or lose five? It's going to gain three, and if it gains three electrons, then it would take a minus three charge. Okay, so gaining three electrons would give it a phosphorus three minus charge. Does that make sense for whoever asked? Okay, good. Okay, so that was 17. How about 18? Is that it yet? Okay. So for 18, we're looking for uh, an oxygen atom. We're looking for the number of unpaired. So for oxygen, it has six valence electrons, so we're going to put those in. We're going to do it 12 and 3, 6 and 9 o'clock. Those are the first four. Then we start pairing them up. And now I've put in all my six, and I see that I have only two unpaired electrons. Okay, so two unpaired electrons. Two pairs and two unpaired electrons. Are... Questions on that? Number 19. Yes. So it says that the ions below, only blank, has a noble gas configuration. So what we want to do is we want to kind of look at the, at the element and see uh, what would happen if we gave it that charge. So let's, I'm going to shrink this down a little bit. So let's look at the first one there, iodine, I plus. So I've got iodine right here. To get a plus, what do I have to do? I've got to take an electron away from it, which is going to move it over here to look like tellurium. Is that a noble gas? It's not, so it's not I plus. How about S3 minus? So here's sulfur. Okay, so if I give it three electrons to get a three minus, it's going to, if I give it one, it looks like chlorine. If I give it two, it looks like argon. And if I give it three, it's going to have 19 and look like potassium. Is potassium a noble gas? It's not, so that's not right. Uh, how about chlorine minus? Chlorine normally has 17 electrons. If I give it one electron, it's going to look like argon with 18. Is argon a noble gas? Yeah. yeah, so that's why chlorine minus is the right answer. Let's look at the other two. Uh, where are we at? There, oxygen 2 plus. So oxygen's here. 
If I have a two plus, that means I took two electrons away. That would give it six electrons and it would look like carbon. Carbon is not a noble gas. And then the last one there, potassium minus. So potassium normally has 19 electrons. If it has a minus charge, it means I added an electron. That would give it 20 and look like calcium, and calcium is not a noble gas. Okay, so that's the easiest way kind of to look at those, I think. Questions on at all on that one? All right. That was 19, right? Yeah. Uh, number 20. Okay, so same idea with 20. It says which of the following does not have eight valence electrons? Well, eight valence electrons is a noble gas notation. So it's really the same question. So we go through and we do the same thing. Uh, and we're going to find that it's uh, Br, uh, oh, does not have eight valence, sorry, does not have eight valence. So uh, bromine minus, we see, has one extra, so it's krypton, so that does have eight valence. Calcium is a plus, well that's just removing one, so that's going to look like potassium, so that does not have eight valence, that's just going to have one. Uh, so that's the answer, calcium plus. Rubidium plus down here has 37. If you take one away, it's going to have 36 and look like krypton. Uh, xenon already is a noble gas, so that has eight things. Okay, so that's how you do that. Uh, 21. Yeah, 21, you've got to use your imagination a little bit. Uh, so, for a given arrangement of ions, the lattice energy increases as ionic radius, and our, our option is increases or decreases. So, let's think of decreasing. As my, remember, so lattice energy is that energy that gets released as we have gaseous ions coming down together, forming an ionic solid. Okay, the closer those ions can get to each other, the more energy is going to be released because the stronger they're attracted. So, the closer they get together means what about the atomic radius? Smaller. Smaller. Okay, so as, uh, as lattice energy increase is increasing, the ionic radius must be decreasing, okay, to bring that in. And then what about the ionic charge? How does charge affect the amount of energy released? Okay, we want to think of attraction. The stronger the attraction, the greater the energy released. Okay, so what, what causes uh, more charge? An increasing amount of charge or a decreasing amount of charge? Increasing. So as that charge increases, then the attraction increases and the amount of energy released increases. So that should be decreases for ionic radius and increases for ionic charge. That's a hard problem. That's a lot of things. We're out of time. We're doing pretty good. All right. Number 22. Yes. Okay. So for 22, so the easiest way that I found to do number 22 on a problem like this is to just count up the number of electrons that we have. So for the configuration argon, 3D4, okay, argon has eight, or I'm sorry, 18 electrons, and then the D4 adds another four electrons, and so that's going to be 22 electrons, okay, regardless of what element it is, if I have 22 electrons, this would be its configuration, is argon 3D4, so let's just see which of our elements or which of our ions here have 22 electrons? I'm just going to write them all down here. Okay, so vanadium 3 plus. So vanadium normally has 23 electrons, and if it's a 3 plus, that means it lost 3, so that only has 20 electrons. Potassium normally has 19, and if since it's a plus charge, it means it lost one, which means it's at 18. Uh, 
chromium 2 plus. So chromium normally has 24 electrons. So since it's a 2 plus, that's going to be 22 electrons. And so that's it's going, going to be the right electron configuration. Let's just look at the other ones. Manganese 2 plus. So manganese normally has 25 electrons. If it's a 2 plus, it means it's going to have 23 electrons. And for iron 3 plus, iron normally has 26 electrons. And if it's iron 3 plus, it would also have 23 electrons. So they're all pretty close, but the only one that has the same number of electrons and thus the exact same electron configuration is going to be chromium with a 2 plus charge. Okay, there, there are other elements I could have given other charges that would have fit that, but we only want one answer, right? Questions at all on that one? That was 22, let's see, 23. Okay, good, non-metals only for covalent bonds. Uh, 24. Yes. Okay, so the easiest way to see how many covalent bonds can an element form to fill its octet is to look at that atom's Lewis dot structure. Okay, so I'll just I'll draw some extra ones in here. So if we look at something like oxygen, it has a dot structure that looks like that. Something like nitrogen has a dot structure that looks like this. And we're looking here at silicon. And silicon looks like this. Okay, so the number of single unpaired electrons in that atom's dot structure tells us how many covalent bonds it wants to form to fill its octet. Oxygen wants to form two. Nitrogen wants to form three. Silicon wants to form how many? Four. Same as carbon. Okay, for those of you going on to uh, organic chemistry, you'll pretty much learn, yeah, carbon's going to have four bonds to it, always, except for some really bizarre species that do exist, but for the most part, it's going to have four. And when you draw the dot structure for carbon, it's just like the dot structure for silica. <coughs> All right. Uh, 25. 25 is a pretty trivial question when you're given a table of electronegative species. <laughs> So, fluorine. Fluorine is the most electronegative of any of the atoms. Uh, 26. So, for 26, least electronegative is up, and to the right is most electronegative, then down to the left is going to be the least electronegative, and so in that group there, that would be uh, rubidity, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, how about 27? Yeah. yeah? Okay, now the hard part with 27 is trying to interpret the font. Uh, that's an I and a CL there. It's not an iodine, a carbon, and another iodine. And then it just has that one minus charge there. Okay, so... Uh, iodine here is a group 7 element, so it has 7 valence electrons. Chlorine is also a group 7 element, so it has 7 valence electrons, but there's 4 of them, so I've got to do that. And then we've got that minus charge there, so because of that minus charge, I've got to add an extra electron into the valence count, because that extra charge in there went in to help the bonding, and so it is included in the valence shell. So we have 7 and 28 is 35, and the 1 there gives us 36 valence electrons. Uh, let's see, 28. Okay, so for 28, we're looking at the Lewis structure of ASH3. So we've got Arsenic trihydride. Okay. Well, if we look at arsenic here in the periodic table, we see that it's in group 5. There it is, group 5. So that's going to have 5 valence electrons. Hydrogen has 1, and there's 3 of them, so that gives me a total of 8 valence electrons. 
So we want to do the dot structure for the molecule. So we're going to put arsenic in the middle. We're going to attach everything to it with a single bond. That used six electrons to make those three bonds. I have two electrons left over, so those have to go on the arsenic there. Once hydrogen makes its single bond, it's done. It can't do any more. It can't take any more electrons. We never put hydrogen in the middle. We never put lone pairs on hydrogen. Those are two rules that you can pretty much follow every single time. Okay? So, when we're looking here, it says uh, how many non-bonding electron pairs, so lone pair, just that one, that one lone pair on, uh, on the arsenic. All right, uh, let's see, uh, 29, uh, 20, I'm not going to go through 29 because we just don't have the time, uh, but you do need to go through all of the dot structures, so you need to make all the dot structures in there, and then calculate the formal charge uh, for each of those. Uh, let me see which one it probably is. I'm guessing it's HCN. Uh, just looking at it, uh, I guess I can always look up the answer. Uh, 29, oh, it says it's E. Oh, none of them, okay, well, oh yeah, HCN would be fine, yeah, as I think about it. So none of them have a non-zero formal charge. That's just me, I don't like to have none like that. It's a lot of work for none, yeah. Uh, a formal charge that's not zero. So it's one, minus one, two, minus two. You, you're not the only one to ask that question. Don't feel bad. I know they kind of giggled, but that, yeah. It's a weird sounding term, I would agree. It just means it's, it's, not, it's not zero. Because they all try to get to zero. Um, sometimes you get one that's not zero. You get a plus one or a minus one. Don't laugh. Don't laugh at that. That's just not nice. <laughs> Like I said, that wasn't, the, that wasn't the only time I got asked that today. I got asked that a couple times today. All right. Uh, number 30. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, that's a better problem for formal charge. Uh, so, formal charge on nitrogen in the nitrate ion is what? Let me give you the dot structure. That was really nice of them. Okay, so we've got... Double bonded oxygen there with a couple of lone pairs. Got oxygen down here with a few lone pairs. And another oxygen down here with a few lone pairs. All right, so we've got our dot structure. Next thing we do for formal charge is we break all of the bonds in half. Okay, so half the electrons in the bond go to one element, half of them go to the other element. So, we're going to call this oxygen A, oxygen B, and oxygen C, and then, of course, the nitrogen. So, for oxygen A, oxygen B, oxygen C, and then I'm going to put the nitrogen down here. Okay, oxygen normally has how many valence electrons? Six. It's in group six, so it's normally going to have six. So, these are all going to be six minus, six minus, six minus. How about nitrogen? Normally has five. Okay, so five minus. And now we're going to count how many electrons have we assigned it in our structure here. Okay, so oxygen A has two, four from the lone pairs, and then another two from splitting that double bond. So six minus six, so that has zero. That has a formal charge of zero. Oxygen B has two, four, six from the lone pairs, and one from the split bond. So six minus seven... So that's a minus one. Oxygen C is in the same boat. It also has six minus seven. That's going to be minus one. The nitrogen has one, two, three, four from the split bonds. There's no lone pairs, so it has four assigned to it. So that gives it a formal charge of plus one. Now remember the rule about formal charges. They have to add up to the overall charge on the molecule or the ion. Nitrate has a negative one charge. If we add up zero, minus one, minus one, and plus one, 
we do in fact get minus one, so these are valid formal terms. Questions at all on what I did there? I know, uh, I think Dr. Days on fonts actually gives a formula there. It does the same thing as splitting those, those bonds. Yeah. For the nitrogen, so it, it got two from splitting this double bond. It got another one from here, splitting that single bond, and another one from splitting that single bond. So that was our four. Any other questions on that one? Got the impression that one threw some people for a loop. Okay. There's 30. Uh, let's see, 31. Yeah. Right. Uh, on the nitrogen, it's plus one. Yeah. I don't think anybody's coming in here at 9 o'clock. Uh, so how many different resonance structures can be drawn for the molecule of SO3 without violating the octet rule? Okay. Well, I'm just going to go ahead. I'm not going to go through the nitty-gritty of the dot structure, but I'll take us to a point where we can, uh, we can make this determination. You would get to this point eventually. Okay, so if I did the dot structure for SO3, I would get that. I would have, uh, and I'd be out of electrons. So I would have six, or eight, uh, three lone pairs where I need to the oxygen, and sulfur would just have three single bonds to it. So is sulfur happy? No. It's not happy at all. Okay, so what, do, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to bring a double bond down from either this oxygen, or I can bring it down from this oxygen, or I can bring it down from this oxygen. Those are all resonance structures. They're equivalent. So those are my three resonance structures. Uh, is this not like something that can be a catch I just noticed that because of the fact there are three oxygens, there would be three resonance structures. Is that not always the case? Uh, it depends on what else is going on in the molecule. So. If this were a sulfide ion, if it were SO3, 2 minus, then you wouldn't have any resonance structure. So, yeah. Or you might have, yeah, I don't know. So, kind of weird. You do kind of have to look at the, at the whole thing. All right, uh, 32. Yes, yeah, so 32 is the stuff we just covered today if you're in the Monday, Wednesday, Friday group. If you're in the Tuesday, Thursday, I don't know if you did it yet, you may do it, do it tomorrow. So for NH3, you're going to get a dot structure that looks like this. And again, I'm not going to go through all the nitty gritty of doing a dot structure. Okay, so for NH3, you're going to have this. We have four electron groups. I have three bonding groups. I have one lone pair. So I look at my table on my sheet, which has disappeared. Okay, so I have four electron groups. So I'm going to be in here. Three of them are bonding, one of them is a lone pair. So I'm going to have a molecular geometry that's trigonal pyramid, and trigonal pyramid is usually right around 107 degrees. A tetrahedron is 109.5, okay, and then each lone pair you put on there shrinks that by about two. Okay, shrinks it by about two, give or take. It just depends on the nature of the molecule, but about two is, is a good estimate. Sometimes it's a little bigger, sometimes it's a little less. Okay, so the answer there would be 107. Uh, let's 
see, 33. Yeah, okay. I say, you guys, you guys did really well on the molecular geometry and the clickers today. Uh, so, xenon difluoride. So, Xe, F2. I will do the dot structure on this. So, xenon has eight valence electrons. That's weird to write down. Fluoride has seven, and there's two of them. So, that's 14 and eight. That gives me 22 valence electrons. We're going to put xenon in the middle. Draw a single bond to the fluorine. That used four electrons. It leaves me with 18. I'm going to fill the octets of the outer atoms first. So each of those fluorines needs six to fill its octet. That used 12 electrons. I have six electrons left. And so if I have any remaining, those go on as pairs around the central atom. And so now we look at our central atom. How many electron groups do I have? I've got five electron groups. I have two bonding groups, just those two single bonds, and I have three lone pairs. So again, we look at our table. We look for five electron groups. Here we have two bonding groups and three lone pairs. My electron group geometry is going to be trigonal bipyramidal, and my molecular geometry there is going to be linear. So that would be B for 33. This is the exact chart you have on the test. Yep. All right, last one, 34. You guys want to see that one? While we're at it, we're a couple minutes over, but that's all right. Hopefully there's nobody outside waiting to get in. Okay, so for XEF4, very similar compound. I'm going to have 8 plus 7 times 4. It's going to give me 28 and 8, so that's 36. I'm going to have XE, F, F. F, F, that used 8, leaves me with 28. I've got to put 6 around each of these fluorines. It takes a while. Okay, that used 24, it leaves me with 4. So I've got to put on two pairs around my xenon. So I have six electron groups. I have four bonding groups, two lone pairs on that central atom. We look at that on our chart. And we see for six electron groups, four bonding, two lone pairs, we have an octahedral electron group geometry and a square planar molecular geometry. So that would have been C. Ah, all right, a little over an hour there. So um, I will get this set up and recorded or, or posted up onto YouTube, hopefully, and I will put a link onto D2L if you want to listen to it again.